distinguished attendees, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Michelle Klein Solomon, and I'm the director at IOM of the Department of Data Insight and Policy Coordination. My sincere thanks to each of you for joining us from around the globe as we celebrate the International Day of Family Remittances. International remittances are widely acknowledged as a lifeline for families in countries of origin, as well as a driver for development. In 2022, just as an example, an estimated US dollar 831 billion was remitted by migrants globally, surpassing both official development assistance and foreign direct investment in countries of origin. Remittance to low and middle income countries alone reached an estimated 647 billion US dollars the same year. You can see the majority, overwhelming majority, goes to low and middle income countries. These impressive figures do, however, mask continuing barriers and challenges for migrants, their families, and communities and countries of origin to fully leverage the benefits of international remittances. Transaction costs for sending remittances remain high and far above the sustainable development goal can target of just 3%. Many corridors are in the double digits. This is an important day to reflect on how remittances are affected by factors such as age, gender, education, digital literacy, migration status, and the geographic location of remittance senders and receivers, both in terms of their countries and whether they live in a rural or urban setting. For example, despite the lack of remittance flow data that's aggregated by sex of remittance senders or receivers, gender norms, roles, and dynamics within households and communities underpin expectations and perceptions around remittances. There are also gender differences in who uses informal or less regulated channels to remit, and who uses more formal technology-driven remittance channels. As IOM, we are deeply committed to facilitating, expanding, and enhancing regular migration pathways while reducing irregular and unsafe migration. This is a key priority as set out in IOM's new strategic plan. The plan acknowledges, and here I'm quoting, that well-managed regular migration pathways, strengthen global value chains, and increase development financing through remittances, excuse me, and diaspora capital. Improving regular pathways can improve the earning potential of migrants and their ability to remit safely and securely in line with SDG target 10.C contributing to the sustainable development of their countries of origin. Evidence-based discussion on the challenges to and opportunities for leveraging international remittances for the benefit of migrants, their families, communities, and countries of origin are important for our work as the UN Migration Agency, as we focus on improving access to regular migration pathways and the benefits thereof and for the realization of the Sustainable Development Goals. Hence the importance of today's event, organized in partnership with the Norwegian Agency for Development Cooperation, NORAD. I am pleased to welcome to this webinar individuals who are expert on the subject and many of whom are collaborators of IOM. Without further ado, let me turn to Gunvor Witz Schank, Director of the Department for Partnerships and Shared Prosperity at the Norwegian Agency for Development Cooperation, NORAD. Dear Gunvor, I would like to also extend my sincere thanks to you and your government for your support of migration and the SDGs and international remittance solutions globally. Many thanks for being here today with us and the floor is yours. I thank you. 
Thank you so much, Michelle, and thank you for welcoming me, and thank you also for inviting us uh, to to co-host this with with you. That's a great honor and and pleasure. So my name is Gunnar Skonke. I'm acting head of the Department for Partnerships and Shared Prosperity in NORAD. Um, I'm sure you're not that interested in NORAD's nuts and bolts, but I, I wanted to give you an update on an upcoming reform that is taking place uh, this August because it's relevant to what the, the to discussion today. Uh, we will, from August, uh, be responsible for most of the Norwegian development uh, grants, meaning both, uh, particularly the humanitarian assistance that has been with the ministry, but also human rights. And that gives us new opportunities. And we will have now um, a separate department for humanitarian support, dealing both with humanitarian support and stabilization prevention. And in the midst of this uh, comes migration and remittances. So um, I think that gives us uh, new opportunities. And we will try to do this through uh, a, nexus, um, a nexus approach. Of course, I mean, there will be no, it won't be a magic new uh, approach from Norway as of mid-August, but it's a good start. And, and I think we have the right foundation uh, to really get a better grasp uh, on, uh, on migration and remittances. Um, we are doing a little bit now, uh, and we are engaged uh, through a working group in, in the World Bank and Nomad uh, through Statistics Norway uh, on the issue of reducing fees uh, for remittances. It's a highly relevant issue. And the, the report for, from this ongoing work will be pre presented in October. Um, Norris focus is, of course, uh, uh, efforts that are based on evidence and knowledge. And I therefore look very much forward to the presentations uh, today. Evidence is a basis for changes in policy and action. It featured prominently in the Mon Monterey consensus and subsequent financing for development outcomes recognizing the contributions that greater financial inclusion can make to business development, social prevention, enhancing household and business resilience, uh, etc. And I think all of us in this virtual room are aware of that. So I would ask then, is it, or why is it challenging for us to get enough attraction to leveraging remittances? I asked my colleague, colleague if this was a good question to ask today, and he said, well, yes, it might come right back to you. <laughs> uh, and well, it might, but I, I will take that risk because I, th I do think that we need more traction, more attention to remittances and uh, all the, you know, the, the possibility that, that comes with that, that, it, that is underutilized in my opinion right now. So I, with those few words, Looking very much forward to presentation today, uh, more evidence, uh, more knowledge uh, for us to use also in the, the new setup uh, in NORAD. So thank you. Thank you so much, Gunbo. We really appreciate um, those very kind words. And also we certainly appreciate uh, Norway's uh, leadership in the area of international remittances. Uh, my name is Mari McAuliffe. I head up the migration um, research and publications division and edit the world migration report uh, i'm really delighted that we have uh, norad with us and we also have some really fantastic speakers today and bringing their expertise their knowledge their research findings from various parts of the world and looking at uh, international remittances through many different lenses uh, which we'll be taking you through uh, over the course of this of this webinar I'll just quickly provide a short update. It's really just the very big picture on international remittances from the latest World Migration Report, the 2022 edition that was launched by our Director General in uh, Dakar in Bangladesh last month. And really just to frame the discussion from a global perspective and then our esteemed panelists will be able to take us through their particular thematic areas and geographies um, as well. So hopefully you can see my screen. Yes, that looks good. Thank you very much. 
This, as I mentioned, is just from the WMR, the World Migration Report 2024. And within the World Migration Report, we provide a chapter that is a global overview of migration and migrants. Uh, we look, of course, at uh, the global population of international migrants as well as uh, international migration flows. We look at specific groups, uh, policy constructs, so to speak, of international migrants. But we also have for many years now looked at international remittances. We know that migration is more than just international remittances, but we also know that it is one of the key drivers to human development globally and a very, very important and resilient component of human development uh, and the SDGs, even when other areas of policy have not done so well over time. So here is this um, World Bank uh, data that we have on the left. I think many people online, our participants, certainly our panelists will know this data very well. It's from uh, the year 2000 up until 2022. And here we have foreign direct investment in the blue line, official development assistance in the green line, and international remittances in the red line. And what we have seen over time is that we have seen international remittance flows to low and middle income countries uh, really uh, hold up and continue to accelerate, notwithstanding some challenges along the way, particularly the global financial crisis and of course, uh, COVID-19. And as you can see, uh, international remittances have far outstripped official development assistance to low and middle income countries for many, many years, but have recently overtaken foreign direct investment, which is impacted, as you can see there from the graph, by crises uh, around the world. We know, though, as Michelle mentioned, that uh, the costs of sending uh, remittances internationally uh, is not even, and certainly notwithstanding the SDG target, it hasn't really made a lot of progress in some locations, such as Europe and Central Asia, which was really stagnated in terms of the costs of sending international remittances. Sub-Saharan Africa, as we can see uh, up the top here, is still the highest uh, in the world. And we know that, of course, uh, for least developed countries and for developing country contexts, international remittances are increasingly important. When we look at the top 10 over time from 2010 through to 2022, we can see the key countries still featuring across that time span and certainly over longer periods of time. But what is interesting is the variation in the volume of international remittances. And here I've just highlighted India, and we can see that India has made enormous sort of strides in receiving international remittances uh, over the last uh, decade, as has Bangladesh, for example, more than doubling uh, in terms of the total volume. But it is highly uneven, and some countries have not benefited as much as others, and we certainly saw COVID-19 change some of the landscape in terms of international remittance flows. You may recall that the World Bank had forecast a 20% drop in international remittances globally at the beginning of the pandemic, but by the end of 2020, there had been a decline, but it was only a slight decline. It was 2.4% globally, and a decline of 1.6% to low and middle income countries. We also know, uh, including from previous global events, such as the GFC, the global financial crisis, that migrants and diaspora tend to remit more if and when they can, when there are crises occurring so that they can support their families and their communities back home. We also know that the digitalization of remittance transfers during COVID out of necessity because of the huge changes to international mobility regimes meant that some uh, channels moved from informal, the so-called suitcase remittances channels through into formal channels. And we also know at the same time that COVID-19 had an impact on currency fluctuations and destination country 
uh, economic situations such as uh, higher inflation. And you may recall that there were a lot of uh, labour market impacts at that time. If you're interested in exploring specifically the COVID-19 impacts, we have a chapter uh, that has a whole section on international remittances and what that also may mean for the longer term. We also know that some countries are quite reliant or heavily reliant on international remittances in the context of their economies. There's no consensus really on how to define reliance, but one measure is share of GDP. And here we can see from the WMR Global chapter that the top 10 countries with the highest shares range from 23% right up to 51% of GDP. If you're interested in, in learning more about how international remittances feature within the broader discussion of uh, migration and displacement, uh, there is just a very, very short piece uh, published recently by the World Economic Forum that really highlights how migration is a global strategic asset, particularly in terms of human development. That is all from me now. Let's turn to our panellists. We have an esteemed uh, group of panellists and they will be bringing their perspectives, as I mentioned, from all over the world. Uh, we will turn first to our first speaker, Marta Bivand Erdal. And Marta is a research professor in migration studies at the Peace Re Research Institute in Oslo at the Migration Centre. I'll hand over to Marta, who will be taking us through some of the aspects related to technology. Thanks, Marta, and thanks again for joining us. Thank you very much, Marie, and thanks for the invitation um, to be here with you all. I'm very gr grateful to colleagues both at IOM and at uh, NORAD for bringing us all together today here to stop and really think a little bit about what it is we know and how it matters uh, in the context of this International Day for Family Remittances. So I'm going to make three brief points in my allotted seven or eight minutes. Um, and I'll do that based on research that we've been doing here with colleagues at Prio for the past 20 years. And I'll in particular draw on research that's also ongoing on two projects, MIGNEX and uh, Migration Rhythms, but also drawing on past works. So or if you're ever interested, do, do look up our web pages. And the three brief points that I'd like to make basically start with this term family remittances which is what brings us together, right? And I'll try to come back to why I want to refer to that. Um, but I'd also like to remind us of the existence of internal remittances and perhaps suggest that there's a missing link here somehow often when we discuss international remittances and perhaps not think too much about internal remittances. I'll try to suggest why and hopefully you'll be convinced. And then as Marie said, I'll, I'll get to technology and really try to reflect a little bit on this question when will mobile phones cut the costs more? So first, let me start off uh, with this term family uh, remittances. Um, so I think there's an important question here in terms of who is in and who is out when we talk about family remittances. So attention to uh, family remittances as a term allows us, I think, to think about which individuals we're, we're actually speaking of, which people. Um, and I think uh, we might then refer often to senders and receivers. Uh, and we have some particular ideas about how that, how that actually might work. And I think very often we talk about this in terms of um, remittances that we think are being sent to a household. So we might think about this in terms of a figure like this. Um, and of course, that is true for, for very many remittances globally, international remittances not least. Uh, but I'd like to take a moment to, to ask you to reflect a bit with me on, on the transfers that go into households and also perhaps beyond them and between households in different kinds of ways. And as I know also Kavita will touch on, we'll talk about gender. There's a lot more to say about that. Who are the senders and receivers and what we do, what do we assume about them in terms um, of their gender? Uh, but I think also it's interesting to think about these other people. So the cousins and the aunts and the neighbor's daughter who also are a part of this broader extended family and beyond kind of extended family networks as well, where remittances also uh, matter. Um, and I think it's interesting to think about this also in relation to considering beyond regular monthly remittances, but those ad hoc latent transfers that are there. And I think Marie also alluded to that in terms of the crisis uh, dampening impact of remittances often as well. 
So while we know uh, a lot about the human costs and economic gains about migrants and family members staying back, I think it's really worth flagging the roles then of these these other people that are involved and to keep our eyes fixed on on the people and, and really thinking critically about who's in and who's out when we talk about family remittances. And then this uh, suggested uh, missing link when it comes to internal uh, remittances. And I think these are images some of you might recognize from, from India, from Mumbai, but I think this goes to many other contexts around the world um, as well. Internal remittances are really uh, important. And I think it's an area we need to understand better and not least understand better the connections between internal remittances and international uh, remittances. And so I just wanted to share with you a couple of, uh, of notes from some field work I was doing in Mumbai. Uh, so I wrote, changing remittances practices over time in families as social mobility is achieved and middle class status in Mumbai too. Shifting investments from between remittances to parents back home and kids' education in the city further afield internally or internationally. And so I was seeing how when people move to the city, for instance, in a country like India, but this happens with urbanization all around the world, there are a lot of transfers and people may not even think of them as remittances because they're just supporting their parents. And this then happens in a particular moment, a particular decade, perhaps. Then life shifts and changes. And then your focus is on other people, perhaps here where you are, perhaps elsewhere. And in terms of, for instance, um, middle class families in India, certainly education, both within the country. Uh, and you have to often move quite far in India <laughs> to go to study somewhere else within the country. But also internationally is a huge thing. And it then often means there's money being sent back and forth. Reverse remittances are relevant here as well. Uh, and then sometimes it sort of shifts between in, between being internal and international. I think those um, types of transfers that there are a lot of uh, are perhaps a mi missing link when we're discussing international remittances solely. And it would be interesting, I think, to explore that further. But then, and this brings me to my, my final point that I really want to focus a bit on as well. How is it that people generally tend to transfer uh, money? And I think we, we kind of know that from many contexts. And I've taken this image from the Pakistani context where I've done a lot of research as well, where Easy Pesa has a huge market share. I think everyone in this virtual room probably has a phone. Um, most of us are perhaps more privileged than the global average, that's fair. Uh, but still a lot of people around the world do have access to smartphones, not directly, but through someone. Or of course, many people have them themselves as well, right? And so in, for internal money transfers, mobile phones are so pervasive already. And I think for me then, the main question which I've sort of left with in terms of this technological opportunity is, is this question really, when will mobile phones cost, cut the costs more? And we've kind of been waiting for this for a very long time already. And it, it, COVID did a lot to help, but still in terms of cutting the transaction costs, not really. And also in terms of how you can actually use different types of phone apps without having to use a credit card or bank transfers as the back end of that for international transfers is really not that well resolved. It's sort of starting to work a little bit regionally in parts of the world, but certainly in South Asia, this is not yet fixed at all. Internally, yes, but for international cross-border money transfers, uh, there's a bit of a, a challenge there in terms of how mobile phone networks and companies operate and how the regulations on financial transfers uh, operate. So I'm not sure whether, Gunvor, I'm really helping you with creating a lot of excitement for how to you know, get more people on board with this. Uh, but I think really the key in terms of being able to reach this 10C SDG goal of reducing transaction costs perhaps lies in this slightly, you know, gray, maybe boring area uh, of, of what is possible to do through financial regulation and what is possible to do when it comes to technological uh, companies and the mobile phone industry uh, specifically. And I think while that ha sounds maybe a bit sort of tech and boring and gray and one on the one hand, the good news is that I think really there are huge potentials to reduce the transaction costs exactly through this way of doing it because it's already happening and internal remittances are such a great example of how that is really working. So the good news maybe is that it's not a very provocative way in terms of the migration debates in many of our countries of how to try and do something which is really, really great and, in, and really harnesses the impacts of remittances for development in countries around the world. So I have no idea, how, idea about how I'm doing for time, but I think I'll wrap up there uh, with just summing up saying that family remittances, maybe let's think a bit more about who's in and who's out and remember both intra and inter-household remittances and thinking about this over the long term. And then this missing link with internal remittances. I hope I've, I've uh, tempted more of you to explore these connections. I'm sure many of you thought a lot about and know a lot about here as well. And considering the interactions between internal and international remittances further. 
And then this question, which I unfortunately don't have the answer to, but I wish maybe someone has. When will mobile phones finally actually make that huge difference that I think many of us are waiting for? And perhaps some of the answers lie in this sort of slightly gray, boring area of the technical and regulatory landscapes around mobile phones, uh, as well as the financial market and regulation of international transfers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marta. Um, uh, making us think, as always, uh, which is really great. You were fantastic on time. That is uh, perfect. Um, certainly from my policy background, not from my uh, research uh, academic background, often those sorts of you talk about boring um, financial regulations. They're so critical and they're so important. And it's usually trying to find the way in which that can be dealt with through a hot topic. And so immediately what comes to mind and including because Adrian and I have been in discussions earlier this week with some researchers who are visiting Geneva, you know, looking at climate finance and resilience around disaster risk reduction may provide some entry points into trying to shift some of that discussion and some of that debate. I think it was wonderful for you to bring in the internal remittances and the international remittances to highlight, you know, this, this, this stark difference. So thank you so much. It's made us all think. Most definitely. I'll now turn to uh, Kavita Data. Kavita is Professor of Development Ge Geography at Queen Mary University in London. Uh, she will be presenting on her extraordinary body of work, which really focuses on, on gender and gender and migration and international remittances. We're really delighted, Kavita, that you could join us. And we also know that you have to uh, get going soon. So thank you again for making the time and, and fitting us into your hectic schedule. Over to you. Thanks, thanks, Maria. Thanks for the for the invitation and the very warm words. Um, Thea was going to share the screen. Um, so great. I was going to spend my allotted time just trying to focus on gender and thinking about the gendered barriers and opportunities to leveraging um, remittances. So by way of setting it up um, on the next slide, I think We'll, we'll, well, everybody on this call will be aware and familiar with the migration development nexus and how since the 1990s, at least, there's been this idea that this is a nexus that affords a triple win. It affords a win to migrants, it affords a win to home nations and host nations, so that everybody stands to gain from, from, from migration. And the critical linchpin of the migration development nexus is, of course, remittances. That is what makes it sort of a triple win for, for all parties concerned. The gradual sort of interest that's come on leveraging um, uh, is, 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 is important. And I think there's two key dynamics, two, two or two key elements rather to leveraging. Um, and the first is around thinking about the remittance infrastructure and how this might be strengthened. So ideas that, that really were, were articulated in, 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 in the setting up of this session, thinking about transaction costs, thinking about how to promote formal channels for, for remittance transfer to address geographical concerns, particularly with the last mile. Um, but leveraging is also about enhancing or creating enabling policy environments whereby remittances for development are, are, are possible or the potential for that is, is, is realized. And here really the, the, the initiatives have been around incentivizing productive savings, incentivizing investment, um, and playing around with different kinds of financial instruments, including diaspora bonds. So the potentially beneficial impacts of leveraging remittances on poverty reduction and on sustainable development are recognized. But equally, both in the academic and policy um, uh, environments, there is a recognition also that the, 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 it's, it, these impacts are very uneven, very geographically differentiated, and that the success in terms of moving towards productive sort of investment types of, 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 of remittances um, has, is, is limited. Um, I'd like to suggest, or, or I'd like to bring in just, Maria, what you touched on there quite briefly is thinking about leveraging in another context now, and increasingly we're talking about leveraging remittances for climate change mitigation. So not just in relation to poverty um, alleviation and, 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 and sustainable development or in, in, in relation to sustainable development. And I'm just starting on a project which is looking at the link between gender um, remittances and climate change mitigation and thinking about this in the context of uh, food insecurity. So, so, so trying to sort of think about how we leverage remittances for climate finance. But moving on then and focusing specifically on the relationship between gender and remittances, um, 
I think it's 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 a fair observation that women have been predominantly so the first obviously fair observation is that the, the remittance literature is very much based on a binary understanding of gender as women and men, um, and, and 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 that we're stuck within that frame. But within that framework, then women have been predominantly recognized as recipients, and it's only been with the feminization of migration that women as remitters have emerged and as sort of significant remitters in their own rights. I think sort of missing within this kind of story of re recipient and remitters is also the management of remittances. And here again, we know that women play a really significant role in managing remittances and the distribution of remittances. And in that management also in the management of expectations, the management of those cousins and the aunts that Marta was talking about of, of, of what their share of these remittances should be. The common wisdom also is that women are better remitters, that they send a greater proportion of their wages, that they remit for longer periods of time, that they invest in human capital, in their children's education, in the food security of their households, in the health uh, well-being of their households. To some extent, I think we could we could say that some of this, this wisdom is also based upon, upon sort of very entrenched gender norms and expectations that women should share and women should care. And therefore, that they, they're sort of, if you like, socialized in those kinds of contexts where, where these kinds of financial behaviors are expected of them. The global remittance agenda, which emerges out of the, the migration development nexus, gives us a different sort of insight into women and in thinking about financial inclusion and thinks about how you might empower women and address gender inequalities by making women um, part of financial circuits. And here, the understandings of gender are slightly different. So yes, there is uh, uh, an appreciation of women as mothers and carers, and that is what is driving their sort of remittances, but also a particular interest in, in, in gender as women are seen as an untapped market, but also as women are seen as economic actors, as entrepreneurs in their own rights. So if we move on then, and just to shed a little bit of light on this from, from kind of evidence, um, I'm talking mostly about a project that, that's just finished, which was called Connecting During COVID. It was funded by the UK ESRC, and it sought to do three different things, which was to map crisis and resilient remittance trajectory. So I was listening with interest, Maria, to what you were saying there about sort of quote, remitting during COVID, to think about migrant well-being and situating these sort of remittance sending as practices of care. So let's stop thinking about financial flows, but think about remittances as embodied and um, uh, practices of care. And then the digitization of social and financial relationships through COVID. Um, and we did this research with new and old communities um, living in London, Glasgow and Cardiff and communities of Somali, Indian and Brazilian heritage. And the methods comprised of, you know, mixed methods, survey, interviews, focus groups, and also community spotlight workshops. Moving on then to just sort of highlight some of the key sort of gender dynamics and just focusing on the survey respondents, we interviewed slightly more women than we did men. Of these, just over half of women remitted, slightly more men remitted. I think what is important here to take into account is that we need to focus beyond gender and we need to adopt intersectional understandings of subjectivities because these figures are very much dependent upon nationality, upon class, and upon migration status. So on an average, it looks, you know, it looks like this, but if we start to sort of uh, to, to fracture this along these different, these different um, identities, then it's something quite different. Remittance sending, perhaps not, not surprisingly, given what Maria said, increased in response to COVID-19, especially increased amongst those communities where there is a great deal of dependence on migrant um, remittances. So within the Somali community, where one respondent told us, you know, if we don't send money, then they don't eat. So there's a real understanding of the critical nature of remittances, but also amongst Brazilian women, which was very interesting because this is in the UK. These are uh, predominantly middle-class migrants who will very often say their families don't need their remittances. And also perhaps unsurprisingly, given the limits to physical mobility, the digitization of remittance sending increased, both amongst women and men during the pandemic. Um, and here what we saw is that adult children played a critical role because they were at home and they could actually teach their parents how to send remittances digitally, but also some money transfer agencies and particularly what you might call ethnic money transfer agencies invested some money in creating digital literacy amongst their clientele um, during the pandemic. Moving on then, um, and really thinking about barriers and opportunities to leveraging. Um, and I wanted to just end with so, sort of thinking through some of the things that are coming out of the research. Um, I think what is important when we talk about digital literacy and digital illiteracy is that digital literacy amongst migrant communities and certainly the migrant communities that I work with in, in, in the UK is very high and digital usage is very high. So again, during COVID-19, we had, I remember a participant telling us that WhatsApp was hot during the pandemic. And what she meant was literally it was blowing up because there was so much information exchange going on, et cetera. 
But while you might be quite sort of digitally, digitally literate, there is a strong hesitancy in using these mechanisms, particularly for financial transactions. And this persisted through the pandemic and within the Somali community and a particular subsection of that community. So the older community, we could already see by 2022 people reverting back to in-person, in-cash remittances. So coming off digital channels that they had used uh, during the pandemic. I think it's important to recognize that digital accessibility can work against migrants, both women and men. And just connecting back to a point that Marta was making is that we need to be alert to the fact of remittance fatigue amongst migrant communities. Making yourself sort of making it very easy for you to remit means that it becomes more difficult to manage expectations. And for people who have been remitting for long periods of their lives, and particularly for women remitters, because they're remitting for long periods of life, being accessible via a mobile phone. Your, your, your recipients knowing that you can send money easily actually creates greater pressure to remit then. And so remittance fatigue is something to think about. And the last thing that I wanted to really touch upon was women's um, decision, um, uh, women's decision making in how remittances are sent, who they're sent to and what they're used for. I think we know relatively little about this amongst women who are connected to men. So who are remitting as part of a household. And I think that's quite an interesting thing to think about um, as well in terms of, you know, we need we need greater sort of um, intelligence there. And then the last point, perhaps not on the screen, which is that maybe some reflection is required on the fact that migrants, their families, home countries and host countries priorities are not necessarily aligned or not necessarily always aligned and that they are sometimes working at, at, at two different sort of agendas and different priorities. But thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kavita. Very, very rich um, insights there in such a short space of time. Thank you very much for, for sticking to time and uh, also for being with us. And I know you have to get going uh, soon. Just really touching on some of the key and critical issues around gender and migration. And there's always more work to do, as you have highlighted uh, in your presentation. And, and including because there's such diversity um, this is not a homogenous area, so there's a huge amount of diversity uh, by geographies, by uh, groups of migrants, by their status um, as well. And I'll now turn to, speaking of diversity and geographies, I'll turn to Linda Lucho. Uh, Linda Ucho is the Executive Director of the African Migration Development Policy Centre in Nairobi. And Linda will be taking us through her body of work on East Africa in particular, um, because again, it is quite different depending on which geography you're in, as we saw from the earlier slides around remittance. Transaction costs is really just one element. There's a whole range of different aspects. And I'm uh, uh, delighted that you mentioned Kavita to intersectionality because that is really fundamental to a lot of behaviours, as well as a lot of policy um, and operational constructs. So Linda, thank you for joining us. Uh, we're delighted that you're here. Thank you, Mari. I'll hand over to you. I hope you can hear me. We can. Thanks. Great. Uh, thank you so much. My internet kind of went out for a second, so I, I hope I was not going to be kicked out. Uh, but thank you so much for this opportunity to speak on this uh, topic in particular, because this is something that I guess is a hot topic globally, regionally, uh, at national level. Um, and it's kind of hard to follow Marta and Kavita because some of the points they were raising were kind of things that you're thinking about, but I don't know how to frame and they package it so well. But uh, like you mentioned, I will focus on the East Africa component. I will be a bit biased and focus on Kenya because that's the country I work on mostly. But my intervention is going to focus on how we're seeing how this space or the knowledge in this space has changed through time. Because initially we were on this debate and discussion about how migration contributes to development and obviously established uh, remittances is a key aspect that contributes to development. And globally we hear about how remittances are higher than the FDI and ODI, which refers back to Mary's um, presentation where she was showing the graph that was just showing it through time. And in the region it's, it's, it's quite reflective of the same in the sense that remittances has been increasing through time and COVID we saw a in the region, despite the mobility issues, there was a lot of money coming in, especially from the US and uh, Europe. Uh, where there was a dip was in the Gulf states because a lot of the uh, migrant workers in those countries were actually, had they had stopped working and they were trying to find pathways to return to the country. So that actually 
gave the governments and in the region uh, a key point to discuss on how we can actually support or protect the migrants in those spaces uh, while they're working so that at least they don't encounter a situation where they're in distress and they're unable to work and have to find pathways to come home. But one thing we saw uh, in most recent times from COVID was that the increase actually was from the Gulf states in Saudi Arabia. In Kenya and Uganda particularly, if you look at the World Migration Report, there's reference to uh, 4 billion being received in 2020 um, in Kenya and 1.2 billion US dollars received in Uganda, which shows that there's a lot there's a lot of money moving around within the country, I mean, to the countries um, of origin, and there's a need for us to find a way to leverage that. And this is where governments come in, trying to figure out how do we actually uh, leverage on the potential development benefits of remittances in our respective countries, communities, and localities. Now, this has been a big question, I guess, for most countries in terms of what kind of pathway or intervention or program can they create that you can see a direct impact on development. In Kenya, what we saw that was working, that was protecting the interests of the sending, the, the migrant, was, was diaspora banking. So creating aspects where they can save money and invest in real estate, for example. But then you cannot continue to build on real estate. You have to expand um, towards other development projects, maybe looking at agriculture, health, or education. So exploring pathways of how we can do that is where many countries are trying to figure out how are migrants actually doing this with or without government initiatives. Now, the interesting thing is that there are examples of that happening. And when we were working with the World Migration Report with Mari, there was evidence of um, work in the Gambia, how they've actually changed um, the, the remittance space, the digital services. They've actually formalized the remittance ch channels and allowing migrants from the UK, Gambian migrants in the UK, to actually pay for utility services such as electricity and water. So there are aspects where they are examples where uh, countries are testing and implementing certain projects and initiatives. They could be small scale, but there's that aspect where you can scale up depending on the context of the country. And within the region of East Africa, there's actually a regional, um, Eastern Horn of Africa in particular, there's a regional discussion or approach of how we can actually leverage on uh, remitt remittances for development. IGAD, for one, is also working with the United Nations Capital Development Fund to sort of address that aspect of cost of remitting uh, of remitting back to um, the respective countries in the region. Because in Africa and I'm sure in other regions, the remittance the most expensive remittance corridors are within Africa and within the region. So how do we actually address those challenges by exploring it through research, assessing where the gaps and the bottlenecks um, exist? and try to reduce that, um, the cost for remitting. But also some work being done by the Afghan Institute for Remittances has actually found that the problem is not reducing the cost of remittances. It is about uh, changing the perception of the mi migrants' behavior, the remittance behavior, the household's behavior in terms of using the, the remittances that they receive. So they're bringing a whole host of um, aspects that we need to consider when we're looking at what, are, what does leveraging remittances look like for development? And how would it look like as a region, as a country, and as a community? Because these are different settings where remittance, uh, the impact of remittances are actually felt. So one thing, um, I, I, it goes back to the question that was raised to us. I, I think it's a challenge for us as researchers to think about, you know, how do we now get people to get the buy-in of the remittances, leveraging remittances for, de for development? I feel that's a very big question that will take time to answer for one, simply because we need to look at the spaces in which remittance, um, remittances are received because we have to look at the political dynamics. If there are political changes that take place in a country, uh, they may not borrow or use the same approach that was adopted by another, uh, by another um, political party. And everything shifts, including the behavior of the remitter. And they would go back to that aspect of using old channels of remittance behavior. For example, now, if we are seeing that they're going to be taxing, putting certain tax measures towards remittances, people will go back to the old system of the suitcase uh, remittance. I think that's what Marie referred to. So we need to factor in that our environment in which remittances are sent are quite critical for guiding us in, in terms of how we can actually maintain existing path uh, pathways that actually work. But the good thing is that we're not where we started before in terms of trying to convince people that remittances is important. We, we are in that space. We're in the space of trying to figure out how can we leverage it. 
uh, for development by creating development products that actually help the community, the country as a whole. And this may require us to maybe look at both things, the financial remittances and the social remittances. How do we marry the two and leverage on that aspect where we can actually work with the remittances sent by diaspora, but the skills network and knowledge that they have in that space. So I'm hoping in the next couple of years, we'll be in a different conversation about, you know, the, um, the impact of remittances on development. We'll have better examples of it. But for now, we're in that space where we at least halfway or transitioning through the process of addressing um, the challenges of remitting to uh, countries of origin, but also leveraging the benefits of remittances in the countries of origin and destination. So I think I'll hand over back to Mari. Um, I probably went over time, but I hope it was good enough for now. Thank you so much. No, thank you so much, Linda. You you did not. You were under time. Um, thank you very much indeed. And for really painting the picture in terms of, um, well, Kenya, but Eastern Horn of Africa um, as well, and uh, highlighting the fluidity and the changing circumstances around uh, international remittances, which is... Uh, has huge impacts, of course, not just on the aggregate flows, but certainly in terms of, as uh, Marta mentioned, how that actually then plays out within households and who is on the receiving end, most especially. Just um, before we turn to Nazrat, and with your, with your, my apologies to you, Nazrat, I'm just going to ask Kavita a question before she leaves, if she's still on online, because we did get a question <laughs> in the chat that I answered, and it was the, you know, I answered it incorrectly. Um, really, it was about which publication is linked to your last slide, which was on barriers and opportunities that you presented. If you've got specific ones, please um, let us know and we can certainly share them uh, with people who've registered for the webinar, um, okay. if it's a bit long, because I would imagine that it would be a body of work, yeah. not just one particular publication. It's a, it's a few reports, and but it's also a paper that's coming out in International Migration Review. I'll send you the details. Maybe. Fantastic. Thank well, you very much. And we will share that uh, with, with, our, uh, with our attendees, with our participants today. Thanks, Kavita, very much. Now, my apologies, Nazrat. I just wanted to, um, to ask that question of Kavita before she goes. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. You are really doing work, important work, of course, on um, a rare geography when it comes to international remittances compared to many other parts uh, of the world, and that is Afghanistan. Nazrat Sayed is joining us from Maastricht University, where he is a researcher in the School of Business and Economics. I will hand over to you now, Nazrat, and thank you again for joining us. We're really looking forward to hearing about your research insights. Over to you. Thanks so much, Maria, for inviting me to this fantastic webinar. Uh, let me make it full screen. Yes. <clears throat> okay, so uh, I would like to talk about the Afghan diaspora remittances, uh, about the volume of uh, remittances to Afghanistan, and also about the significance and challenges. So, I will begin with an overview of uh, Afghan diaspora. Uh, due to uh, over four decades of conflict, political instability, human rights violation, uh, in war in Afghanistan, uh, there are uh, millions of Afghans uh, who have been living outside Afghanistan. And uh, approximately, uh, there are 10 million Afghan diaspora. And these uh, Afghan diasporas who are based in different regions of the world, different countries, they have contributed financially and non-financially through remittances to their families and also to Afghanistan in general. So if we look at the uh, statistics uh, of international uh, uh, financial remittance to Afghanistan by the Afghan diaspora, uh, so we can see that between uh, 2008 and 2022, there were around 6 billion uh, USD uh, remitted by Afghan diaspora from various countries to Afghanistan. And we can see the fluctuation uh, by year, and uh, which has been increased uh, uh, from uh, 2016 to 2017, uh, from 628 in 2016 to uh, 823 million in 2017. And it was almost stable until uh, 2020, but after that, the international financial remittance to Afghanistan is declined. Uh, and the reasons are different. Uh, it was declined uh, due to political uh, instability in the country, 
uh, and also due to the economic situations uh, of uh, Afghan diaspora in the host countries, uh, plus exchange rate, inflation, and so on. But we can see that it has uh, quite uh, more declined later on in 2021 and 2022 because of the takeover of the, the Taliban, uh, uh, Afghanistan by the Taliban, uh, and there were more restrictions on money withdrawing and also uh, uh, waiting, you know, uh, uh, restriction on the amount of withdrawing money. Uh, so that's why that was the main reason. Another, another reason was uh, there was a shift in remittances because uh, there were many Afghan families who left Afghanistan leaving to neighboring countries. So their family members, uh, let's say in Western countries, they, send, they started sending remittances to those countries, let's say Pakistan or to, uh, Iran. Uh, and also, uh, uh, there was the risk of sending money by, uh, among some Afghan diasporas to Afghanistan, uh, because Afghanistan is a not internationally recognized country. So that was also also a reason which was uh, uh, which reduced the, the amount of uh, uh, formal uh, financial remittances to Afghanistan. Uh, there are various cases uh, I have heard about Afghan diaspora that uh, when they send remittances to Afghanistan, the uh, uh, transfer was blocked by the bank, and they were asked to come and give some details. Why? Who is the person? Why do Why do you send this money? And you please give us the details of the person. So, so because of these reasons, uh, informal uh, channel uh, or remittances through informal channel have decreased also to Afghanistan recently. So there are many Afghan diaspora who send uh, money to their families, relatives, and and friends uh, informally through the the hawala system, uh, which is called hawala system. Yeah. So that's uh, these are some reasons in the fluctuation. Uh, and also, if you look uh, uh, at the estimated bilateral remittances to Afghanistan from top 10 countries, uh, uh, we can see that most of the money was remitted from Iran. So I, I have highlighted this because it's a little bit confusing that uh, international uh, financial uh, transfer uh, companies are not working in Iran, such as uh, MoneyGram and Western Union because of the economic sanctions. Uh, but before the takeover of Afghanistan by the Taliban, uh, there was some possibility of uh, financial official remittances to, to Afghanistan, bank to bank transfer. Uh, there was uh, an Iranian bank operating in Kabul. Uh, but after the takeover of, the, of Afghanistan by the Taliban, uh, the, the bank was closed. So, uh, but recently uh, I have heard that, uh, uh, again, the uh, current authorities in Afghanistan is uh, in discussion with the government in Iran. Uh, to uh, open some channels for uh, financial remittances. Uh, other than Iran, we can see that Pakistan is the second uh, largest country and also following by Saudi Arabia, Germany. But these are like estimations, uh, according to Nomad World Bank. Uh, you can see how they estimate, uh, you know, these uh, uh, bilateral remittances. If you go to the uh, World Bank bilateral remittances matrix, at the end, they have a note and then there they have mentioned their uh, methodology. And if you look at the importance of remittances, uh, yes, uh, Afghan diaspora, they have sent financial remittances to uh, their families, relatives, uh, and friends. And, and this has increased, uh, especially after the takeover of Afghanistan by the Taliban because of the unemployment, poverty, and many more problems. So uh, financial remittances by Afghan diaspora uh, have been more towards health, uh, education expenses, uh, wedding funeral expenses, construction of uh, uh, houses, paying house rent. And what's interesting is recently, uh, there is also uh, more increase towards renewable energy. For example, the, at individual level, there are families uh, who send financial remittances uh, to their uh, relatives or family members uh, to Afghanistan uh, uh, for installation of solar panel, for example, or micro hydro power. So this is also something interesting. So it's not only uh, more towards health, education, and other expenses, but also towards renewable energy recently. And also there are uh, Afghan diaspora who are supporting their family members in out migration and also uh, investment in Afghanistan. So. So 
that was more like at the uh, individual level or family level uh, or micro level. But if we come to a macro level, then also uh, uh, Afghan remittances have contributed in the GDP of Afghanistan. For example, in 2020, there were uh, 789 million uh, USD of financial remittances towards Afghanistan, and that contributed around 4% to the total GDP. But later on, due to the uh, political chaos uh, that shift, the amount shifted or decreased, and also the contribution to the GDP also decreased. Uh, it's also important to mention that uh, there are also non-financial remittances towards Afghanistan. And that is uh, through Afghan diaspora organization based, you know, outside Afghanistan. For example, in Europe, there are several Afghan diaspora organizations who have been contributing in the sector of health, education, humanitarian uh, assistance in, in Afghanistan. Uh, in addition to Afghan diaspora organization, there are also international organizations such as the IUM. For example, they had the CD4D project connecting diaspora for development. Uh, UNDP had a, a project on the transfer of uh, experts, uh, Afghan experts from uh, Western countries to Afghanistan to contribute in, in, in capacity building uh, and so on. And also, World Bank had a program uh, at the very beginning uh, when the international community engaged in Afghanistan. So they were supporting uh, uh, financially and also technically Afghan diaspora experts to go to Afghanistan and they were working as an advisor within different uh, public institutions. Uh, there are also uh, non-financial remittances individually by Afghan diaspora members. For example, uh, if you see in the banking sector, we see some Afghan diaspora who have uh, invested in Afghanistan. And also in the media sector, if you see, there are several examples of Afghan diaspora who have invested in Afghanistan. Same as the case within the telecommunications in, uh, sector. So there are both uh, uh, kind of financial and non-financial contribution by Afghan, by Afghan diaspora through uh, uh, remittances for their families and also in general for the development of Afghanistan. Uh, despite the contribution of uh, remittances, there are also some challenges uh, for Afghan diaspora who are remitting uh, uh, money to their uh, families back in Afghanistan. Uh, for Afghan migrants or Afghan diaspora in the host countries, one challenge is pressure uh, on them. So they feel more pressure because they have to support themselves or their family members here, but also part of their family members back in Afghanistan. I have heard several cases that since the Taliban took over of Afghanistan because of unemployment and poverty uh, uh, in the country, there are Afghan diasporas who have increased their working hours, for example, in Europe. Uh, for the reason that they want to add in a little board, uh, more so that they can support uh, not only their family members, but also their relatives and even their friends. And expectation has also increased uh, from, from, from family members or, or friends and relatives back in Afghanistan. Uh, uh, so this is one, one, one challenge. And the other one is uh, uh, sometimes affect social ties. Yes, some Afghan diaspora, for example, who cannot support let's say their relatives or friends or family members back in Afghanistan that affect their social ties. So they are kind of under pressure uh, to, to work harder and to support uh, their family members back. Uh, money transfer cost and issue is also an issue. It, it's also a problem, a challenge for Afghan diaspora uh, because uh, we talked about the, the cost of the transfer. Uh, sometimes it's expensive if they uh, officially uh, transfer money uh, uh, and also, uh, there is the issue about the amount. As I said, sometimes they are asked, their transfer is blocked. They have to give more details to the bank, why and to whom they transfer the money. Uh, uh, and also, uh, if they want to avoid these things and they refer to the informal channels, they're sort of expensive for them. Uh, so it depends upon the cost, like for 100 euros, you have to pay uh, 6 euro or even sometimes 10 euros. Uh, to transfer, you know, uh, 100 euro to Afghanistan informally to Hawala system. So this is also an, uh, a challenge Nasrat, for... Yeah. I'll just, sorry, hello. Um, I'll just ask you to wrap it up so we can... Yes, okay, yes, the last two speaker. points. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks yeah, so and much. for families, yeah, they are uh, largely dependent on remittances and it has also increased, uh, uh, you know, inequality among, and competition among families. And also for Afghanistan, uh, uh, especially when financial remittances are... Uh, uh, you know, uh, 
send uh, informally, that's also a, a big issue for uh, illegal activities or money laundering, and also dependence of Afghans on external financial resources. It's also an issue. So there should be uh, these challenges should be converted to, into opportunities in order to have more impact on the development in the country. Yeah. Thanks so much. And these are the references. Yeah, thanks. Thank you so much, Nazra. And particularly that last point um, is really critical because we often don't hear that in all of the corridors, but some of the most vulnerable people um, are people who are caught in conflict or caught in uh, situations where you've got financial sanctions, uh, such as, you know, the, the current situation with the Taliban in power. And it creates, you know, a, a triple kind of effect around uh, vulnerabilities and not being able to assist and support. So it's particularly important to um, also highlight uh, human uh, displacement impacts and that you might be having really critical issues around uh, remitting because we often think about just labour migration corridors, for example, connected to international remittances. And while that is super important, and we saw that certainly in the country to country corridors that you highlighted, there are labour migration corridors, of course, as well as longer term diaspora sort of impacts, but it becomes critically important when you have um, a really a conflict or a crisis situation within a country. And we really appreciate you joining us and, and sharing your insights from Afghanistan. Thank you so much. I'll now turn to uh, Dr. Najot Sangwan, who is a lecturer in economics at the University of Greenwich in the UK. Um, Najot is is interesting in the context of food security and looking at remittances and how they really impact food security in India. Um, it's a really critical, and again, it's another sort of hot topic uh, that is really important at the moment and also the intersections with other aspects related to climate change, for example. So very, very interested in, in hearing about your research and your research findings, Navja, and thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thanks, Mary. Hello, everyone. Uh, in this presentation, I would talk about remittances and their role on food security in India. Uh, India is quite an interesting uh, country to study this relationship. Uh, as Mary mentioned in her, in her presentation, that India received the highest amount of remittances in the, uh, in the world. Uh, I think it was 111 billion. And uh, second one was Mexico, which was 61 billion. So almost, uh, almost uh, half. Uh, than India. And uh, another report by the international labor organization said that uh, migrant workers contribute 10% of the uh, GDP of India and probably send a lot of remittances. Uh, another interesting thing about India is uh, that it has been growing at a tremendous pace in the last few years. Uh, over the past 15 years, India's GDP has tripled. Uh, however, this growth has bypassed the poor. We have a high inequality in India and very, very high poverty rates as well. Uh, I think at the $2 per day uh, poverty rate, 9% of the urban population is classified as poor and rural population is 23% live in poverty. However, if you look at the $6.85 per day, 84% uh, of the Indian live in, uh, on, in poverty. So very high poverty rate. At the same time, really high growth, but this growth has now translated into better food security. Uh, India is home to one quarter of the world undernourished population. And uh, in the recent Global Hunger Index, uh, India rank 111th out of 125th, 125 countries. And during the Modi regime, it has actually sliding in this index. Uh, Every third person uh, with her children under five in India are underweight or, or stunted, and a lot of them are wasted as well. Uh, so the researchers are wondering what if growth, uh, if, if not growth, what else can improve the food security? And there has been a considerable interest in remittances over the past few years. Uh, anecdotal evidence also suggests that uh, food security indicators are benefited uh, from remittances and both uh, rural and uh, urban households are increasingly reliant on remittances to improve uh, food security. This was particularly highlighted during the COVID-19 times. Uh, I was in India that time and I got stuck there. Uh, 
during COVID-19, uh, there was a massive reverse migration of uh, migrants, of people who come from uh, rural areas in India and work in the factories and uh, construction sites uh, in the cities like Mumbai, Delhi. So when lockdowns was announced by the Modi government, everything was shut down from industries to, to the farms, to construction sites. So these migrants, these people who live on daily wages and uh, they found themselves in a situation with no work, no income, and no food. Uh, so they decided to travel to their villages, uh, mostly in the central region of India. And uh, some people had to walk around 1,000 kilometers to go to their uh, villages as Indian transport system couldn't cope with the amount of people. Uh, after the long journey, when they got reunited with the family, they found that, that uh, their uh, households were facing uh, food shortages due to the lack of remittances. So this showed how heavily Indian households are reliant on uh, remittances for food security. Uh, there has been a lot of research, not a lot of few research paper have been coming out in the last few years in the Southeast Asia. And most of these research have found that remittances increase the food expenditure, but also uh, food security. Uh, there will be research in India, Nepal, Bangladesh, and Vietnam. Uh, all with positive uh, results of, from remittances. In my own research, along with one of my colleagues, Luca Dashioti, uh, we looked into uh, impact of remittances on not directly into food security, but on uh, indicators related to food security using uh, Indian Development Survey. Uh, we looked into the impact of uh, per rupee per dollar received on remittances on food expenditure and all the on the types of food groups, like are the household that are receiving remittance, are they eating more uh, protein diet or uh, eating less cereal or uh, meat, uh, vegetable, fruits, et cetera. And uh, we looked into the food diversity uh, using three indicators, uh, household dietary diversity score, which is the sum of all the uh, food groups that you consume. Uh, and then two other indexes uh, that are they are used from ecological economics. They used to measure biodiversity in the environment, and we try to use something similar in the in the food diversity, and uh, using various uh, econometrics techniques such as uh, instrumental variable propensity score matching and Poisson regression. We found that remittances significantly in increase total household food expenditure. Uh, we also found that. Uh, the coefficient uh, of uh, remittances is higher than the coefficient of income, which means that remittances are more important than the income of the households in uh, improving uh, in, uh, in food expenditure. Uh, we also found that the household receiving remittances spend more on protein rich foods such as meats, eggs, pulses, vegetable and fruits. Uh, in terms of food diversity, we found that uh, there was a higher score of uh, household dietary diversity uh, among household receiving remittances, which in indicated a very varied diet. And uh, in the Shannon and Simpson indexes, we also found a positive uh, significant coefficient uh, representing uh, better nutritional quality uh, and dietary diversity of those households who receive remittances. Uh, so in conclusion, I want to say that remittances positively affect uh, expenditure on food and improve diversity of food. Uh, it does this to these three channels. Uh, first, it eases the budget constraint, allowing household to spend more on food-related uh, expenditure. And second, along with the remittances, migrants also bring back health and knowledge, uh, nutrition knowledge, which improves the food diversity and dietary practice. And I've seen that in my personal example, I sometimes buy food from my parents and uh, instead of uh, buying like cereals, I buy a lot of nuts, buy a lot of pulses. And uh, I think they probably be more healthier than uh, if they buy the food themselves. And the third quite important one that uh, most of the migrants are male. And uh, when the male leaves the household, the female who received the remittances, they prioritize spending on food over entertainment, and that leads to better food security. Uh, in terms of policy, uh, I want to emphasize that other previous panelists have said the same thing, that we need to reduce the transaction cost of these remittances uh, because uh, the, the like, uh, like Nasrat said, that it costs six euros for uh, sending 100 pounds and I've seen similar in India as well it costs like five euros or something five pounds uh, sending 100 pounds so that's quite high uh, so yeah that's it thank you very much
Thank you much in, very much indeed. And, and there is the publication uh, that you've presented. Thanks so much, Najat. That's really critically important. It gives us a very insight, short insight and a case study that is very crystal clear uh, in terms of the impacts and brought in so many of the different elements from the previous speakers, including gender, for example, and how that actually impacts uh, very directly on food security. Thank you so much. We'll have some questions, I'm sure, in the chat. Um, now I do, I have got a, several questions in the chat for other speakers. So I will turn to uh, Marta, but it also is relevant uh, to Linda too, if she would like to comment. Um, this is from Abel. Thank you so much for posting in here. Um, I'll read it out. It's internal remittances indeed can spur development. However, in Eastern Africa, although mobile phones help out in money transfers, they may not necessarily lower costs owing to various factors such as the mobile network operators, the level of digital financial literacy, which several people have talked about in the in the presentations, uh, the taxation of remitted funds, and there are other issues as well. So the question really goes to um, how you see that and also calls for further research on the subject matter. And I'm sure this is something that Linda can also comment on in terms of existing research and findings uh, that might uh, be in place in Eastern Africa in particular. So Marta, I'll hand over to you first. Thanks very much. And thanks. This is a, an excellent comment. I'm looking forward to hear what Linda has to say and, and maybe others as well from other, other regions in the world. Um, so I wanted to just make a few comments, I think. So um, a lot of my uh, empirical work, apart from what I've been doing here in Norway, um, has been in Pakistan. And so this is kind of where I've been observing over a number of years how how mobile phones have appeared and become more important in how people, you know, what we all do in a way if we have phones, right? Um, and how that is, has impacted also these ways in which that we communicate, uh, the pressure to be able to, to transfer money, but also just the ease of doing that. Um, and so I think definitely there's more need for, for research. And I think there's a lot of uh, regulatory work in each of the countries um, in terms of how to make this work. And just as an example, one of the phone companies that has been uh, in the past quite significant in, in Pakistan has been an offshoot of a Norwegian phone company, Telenor. And they've been, you know, they've been operating as Telenor Pakistan and been huge. And there's been interesting questions about, you know, how is it that you as a customer of Telenor in Norway, say if you're a Norwegian Pakistani, uh, can't kind of benefit from using Easy Paisa with Telenor Pakistan. Um, and so I know that, you know, within these big, um, often international companies, they do a lot of research, but because it's part of kind of them protecting their competitive edge, that's not necessarily research that we as outside researchers get access to. So I think that in terms of the, you know, the calls for research, of course, if you ask a researcher, there's always need for more research. So I'm of course gonna say yes, but I think there's more need maybe to think also about how we can collaborate actually with private actors uh, on in this area in terms of reducing costs. Now there, I think there's a need for government, right? Because we need then governments to kind of come in with some sort of pressure to make sure there aren't really unfair monopolies, for instance, in terms of then being able to uh, to see how you can have you know a fair competition and a competition where private companies can make a profit and and prosper and invest in areas where there is need for more uh, infrastructure, for instance, in collaboration with government. But I think there is kind of a, a huge scope there for for more research, but also research that's kind of very practically oriented in terms of trying to understand how, how can this be done? And I think there are interesting models. And from my quite limited knowledge, I would actually look to East Africa. And I know that that doesn't mean everything is working smoothly. And I, I see that there are also issues to do with cost. But I think there is a lot of, um, of things that seem to be working in terms of mobile money transfers there. But I'm thinking there's maybe a need for more exchange and sharing of examples that work internally in countries. And then seeing maybe, is it possible to lift that up uh, and above? But certainly I do acknowledge there's a lot of, um, of challenges as well. And a final point that I don't know enough about, I just want to put it out there, uh, is that I think you know maybe there is a reason to also be a little bit cautious about the ways in which inadvertently one might promote financial literacy agendas, which I am all for, but kind of the financial digital literacy agendas that in a way force people to have bank accounts and force people to be um, financially active in particular ways. Um, 
I think there's a reason to kind of stop and think how that is implemented and, and done uh, in ways that are also respectful of people's own values and priorities in different kinds of ways. Uh, so I think there's sort of some need to maybe be a little bit critical also of, of, of how one cooperates with different types of both government and private sector actors in this field. But I think there's a need for more cooperation. Thank you very much, Marta. That last comment applies uh, well and truly outside the migration space, that is for sure, <laughs> as we know, <laughs> traveling around and trying to navigate these sorts of systems. Um, Linda, I will hand over to you just for your insights and comments uh, okay, on the yes. question from Abel. Okay, thank you so much for that question. And he's right in the sense that um, as much as we want to leverage on mobile money as a platform where we can actually receive remittances, taxation measures are actually discourage, discouraging people to use that. And I'll give a very quick example because right now we're in this space where the government is putting certain tax measures in Kenya that require us to declare where we receive the money from, what it's going to be, like, what it's going to be used for, the purpose. And that's making people more skeptical about the intentions because this question never got raised before. So it's actually making people less, um, well, it will discourage a lot more people to receive money on mobile money or they'll have a cap. Uh, because if you're receiving more money than you receive on your account, it actually raises a, a red flag to the revenue authority. So people are actually just changing their remittance behavior because of certain measures being adopted by the government that is actually making it uncomfortable for you to be digitally present for them to know how much you're receiving. And uh, just the point that Marta had raised about the internal uh, remittances, that is actually very critical in Kenya. We tend to focus on international remittances, but I think the one that's internal is quite big. And sometimes you can't measure it because it could be in the form of goods, because someone could be sending goods and then they translate it into money. But one thing we saw some uh, on a study we did on migrating out of poverty some years back, we noticed a fair, well, I want to call it a fair exchange because you're sending goods like clothes, um, money to the people back in the rural areas, but they were sending food to the people in the cities because the quality of the food in the cities is not so good. So I think we need to have a stronger, better understanding of that internal remittances aspect, but we also need to continue to understand the mobile space because it's changing at the moment and it's being influenced by dynamics across the globe because now there's this aspect of money laundering. Are we using the right money for its purpose? You want to trace the money. Um, and that's why I said the political environment really matters because if a government wants to really track where the money is going, going to, excuse me, um, it's going to bring a lot more problems because they're going to raise questions, where's the money go coming from? What are you going to use it for? And you just have to lie about you know, <laughs> that information. So there's a lot going on in this space. It's shifting and we don't know whether it's actually going to reduce the cost or it's going to increase the cost. So it'll be interesting to see. Uh, see that and also compare what Marta was saying, what's happening in Asia and in Africa, and then see where there's a middle ground of similarities and differences. Um, over to you, Marie. Thanks so much, Linda. And it often is the case when you're dealing with policy across a whole range of different areas, it, it is those trade-offs. And we do know that there can be collateral damage when very serious um, uh, regulatory issues are trying to be tackled by governments and sometimes there are unintended consequences for people who are not um, engaging in the behaviours that are, that are trying to be curbed or um, moderated uh, very much so. We have quite a few questions in the chat and I do apologise because we will not be able to get uh, to all of them but uh, the next question that was posted is from Raj so this one is to Najot really particularly in terms of your presentation. What do you think um, that a high percentage of remittances are spent on basic food. Why do you think a high, uh, a high percentage of um, uh, remittances are spent on basic food? And what is the link between poor households and a high percentage of remittances spent on food? So that one is for you, Najat, thank you. And to other panelists, if they would like to also comment. Uh, thanks, Raj. Uh, I looked into the data and found that the household who receive remittances, they were spending 50% of their income and remittances income into food, whereas household they didn't receive were only spending 36%. Uh, I'm not sure why, but I think the food is like 50 uh, the fundamental need. So, and uh, and also, as I said, that when people receiving remittances, they are spending more on uh, on a protein rich food that probably costs more money. Uh, I not. I don't think. I don't. I can't answer the why they're spending that. But 
or maybe it's easy as the budget constraint on like the income is used on other things such as uh, school fees or construction or something whereas the remittances which are quite minor are used on uh, in uh, improving the food food related uh, expenditure and nutritional Im improvement so yeah i don't think i can answer in confidently Thanks, Sanjot. And that's certainly in terms of um, some of the work that we've done over the World Migration Report over like many editions, it does come up in terms of basic needs and in certain locations and at certain times, there can be a higher proportion spent. And I'm, I'm thinking about Central Asia at certain points in time where it was very, very much about the um, re international remittances being spent on, on basic fundamental needs of a household, in including and especially food and health uh health services and so forth i am very conscious that we are pretty much out of time and i do not want to um, curb uh, stein eric's closing remarks so thank you very much in indeed to all of our panelists uh to norad for uh co-hosting this with us very rich discussion we could have uh, continued uh, at least for another half an hour or so but very rich insights. We, we have recorded it and we will be posting because we've had a lot of questions um, from participants in terms of being able to access um, the, the resources uh, that you have presented. I will now hand over to Stein. Uh, Eric, who is the Senior Advisor in the Department of Partnerships and Shared Prosperity, that is a beautiful departmental name, I must say, um, in the Norwegian Agency for Development Corporation, NORAD. Over to you, Stein, Eric, and thanks again for co-badging and co-hosting this event with us. Hey. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Marie. This is um, the name of my department. You don't need to remember because it will it will be changed in, in August. We will have a new, <laughs> I will be in a new department, a new section. So, uh, so much for that. Uh, but uh, thank you also very much for, for inviting us to be part of this very, very interesting uh, seminar. Um, it has uh, been also uh, very inspiring to hear uh, uh, experiences from, from many places, uh, from, from India, from Afghanistan, from Kenya. Uh, from from Pakistan um, uh, on on uh, the importance of of uh, remittances, I think we are we are reminded very much of of one thing, and it is obvious for all of us who are part of this seminar that migrants are not victims. Uh, they may be vulnerable, but they 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 are resources. First and foremost, they are resources, assets. Their forces are changed. Um, and they uh, are representing also very often vulnerable societies, uh, both where they come from and where they are uh, working and, and sending the uh, remittances back home. So uh, they are really development actors. Uh, and I think that is important for us uh, working with development to see um, see the, the diaspora, see uh, the migrants um, as, as resources and as potential um, allies in the in the larger development project we see that uh, development um, uh, support is uh, is not increasing very much but um, and and foreign direct investment is uh, is on a decline now we'll see what happens there but um, what is really striking is that Remittances is on a steady growth, so it will be, it, 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 year by year it's growing, even through crisis like um, like COVID, uh, just a little drop and then it it, it, it was uh, growing again. Diaspora uh, has been um, um, presented or has been uh, um, seen as as. Um, um, for some years ago, more as an agent for development projects. How can diaspora become more um, involved in our development uh, projects? It didn't really uh, take off uh, of several reasons. One is that they didn't fit into our systems. They were doing their own thing. They are doing their own development. So I think that our challenge is to how can we as development actors, as development agencies, as the, as the big also, the, the, the big uh, uh, actors like the World Bank, the UN, and, and all, how can we become um, 
supporters and co-workers of the development projects that so many families are are now uh, doing through remittances. I think that is uh, that is also an, an, an important um, um, challenge for for us. And I I think that I take took note of. I mean, there were many things here, but I took note of, uh, and it was phrased in different ways. That the challenge is how can um, how can we strengthen uh, our support to remittances um, and technology or regulation? And I think I think many of of you were uh, referring to this, and it's not uh, technology uh, increased or improved technology and. Um, working on regulations, uh, it is both. It is uh, probably uh, both of these uh, areas we need to work on, and I think that it is also a challenge for development actors to, in in both ways, both to 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 support uh, good technology, and and also to support um, regulations. And the regulations is uh, both in the in the countries where um, that are sending uh, money and, and that are receiving money. And uh, and on a global scale, and we have committed all of us to uh, reducing the fees of remittances to three percent, which is actually the goal. Five um, percent is is the seal; it is the, the maximum, and we are far uh, above that now. So <clears throat> I think that three percent is what we are aiming for. Actually, I heard from one of the. The one of those involved in the negotiations on, on SEGs that he his and he said he was the one that had proposed three percent. Initially, he proposed one percent. So there are no reason for because the, the transferring of money in in the, in some part of, parts of the world is far below three uh, percent. So three uh, percent is really uh, something we should strive for. And um, this has been very uh, rich, and uh, I think this is uh, part of a longer discussion for us in Norway. This is uh, very inspiring, and uh, I hope that we can continue working together like this. Thank you so much, all of you. Thank you very much, Stein Eric, and thanks to all our panelists and also to the great questions and comments in the chat. We really do um, appreciate the chance to actually hear from researchers all around the world to inform policy and operational responses. So thank you again for joining us, everybody online. Thanks so much. Bye.